Okay, um, good evening everyone. Uh, we are at Seniors Hub um, in Juba, South Sudan. Uh, today I am hosting uh, Nya Jok Tonyik. Is that a, <laughs> she, you, if, if, I, if, I, if I don't pronounce it well, you'll correct me. So this is an evening with, um, uh, it's part of the Seniors program. Seniors is a hub for innovation, uh, technology and art. Um, we host a variety of activities here, including a co-working space. Um, and an evening with is a series for interviewing people who have a notable milestone in their life and also wanting to just tap into the experience and see how that can benefit our audience here and also the audience online. Um, and this evening, I am delighted to have uh, uh, Tonique. <laughs> uh, maybe you can just like uh, at the start of this, uh, introduce yourself and um, um, and just talk about yourself a little bit who you are and what you do so that for the benefit of our audience who probably have never gone online or have never uh, got to interact with any of your content absolutely uh it's a pleasure to be here yeah. thank you for hosting me nelson uh online audience and right here hi mm -hmm. my name is nyai york tongi darling i am a sudanese american mm -hmm. i was born here in south sudan in upper nile from my wood county but more than half of my life, over 20 years of my life has been in the United States. Mm -hmm. I'm a mother of three children. My oldest is 20, she's a girl, and then I have a six-year-old and a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. My background is in medicine. I'm a registered nurse, uh, specialized in public health. So I have my master in public health. Uh, I also been in the military, United States military army for the past 13 years currently just retire and um, I wrote a book which is what brought me here in South Sudan so pleasure to be here yeah it's such a delight having you you, you have a, a, can I say like a very rich uh, uh, profile um, something that a lot of people would want to aspire to and also learn from we'll come to that but I just wanted to get a bit about your upbringing like um, like where were you? I don't know if you have any recollection of your life in South Sudan, the two years, <laughs> uh, but, but maybe you can just tell me about your upbringing and like, like where you grew up and how, and how, how, how was the life? Well, yes, I do remember a little bit about my life uh, back in South Sudan. You know, uh, my family moved to refugee camp in Ethiopia when I was three years old. This is when the war started in the 80s. But in the 90s, early 90s, I was taken back to the village, to Nyabogalek, which is my village in, uh, in my wood. And I remember being there with my grandma for two years. And that's the most part I remember about being in South Sudan until recently when I came back to Juba. But I remember playing in Sobat River. Mm -hmm. I remember going to collect you know, dry woods. So, but most of my memories were, my childhood memories were all in the refugee camp, in Dima refugee camp in Ethiopia. So, um, how was that <laughs> for the for the benefit of, of, of probably the U.S. audience? A refugee camp is not a kids camp. <laughs> it's, it's not a summer camp. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's not a it's not a it's not a summer camp for sure. So the life in the refugee camp was for me. I, my family moved there when I was uh, in that refugee camp from the time I remember I was seven mm. until I was 14. So I have a lot of memories from that refugee camp. And I remember about getting food every 15 days. So that's probably took a lot of my memory and my childhood time is waiting for the food to come and what to do when the food is not there. You know, um, like finding different ways to bring food home. My mom, uh, had four kids before we went to Dima refugee camp, and then she had three other kids in Dima refugee camp. So seven of us in that camp, her raising all of us, um, all of it uh, were around food security or insecurity. So uh, whether to go collect fire out dry woods to sell or dry grass to sell or just trading food, you know, like trading lentils, different kind of lentils for some other starch. Um, so, yeah, it's not it's not that not that fancy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that fancy. So then that means one's life really revolves, I mean, to some extent around food and also like other activities um, and stuff like that. When 
while you're in the refugee camp, has, has it ever occurred to you that like you're going to go somewhere else? Was, was that also like at the background of any discussions about going to the US or going to another country? Is that, is that a dinner conversation? <laughs> no, um, I actually didn't think that was all I knew. That refugee camp was all I knew. I didn't think there was any even people that there were people outside of my camp mm. you know i was young there was not too much exposure to the world outside of that camp you know uh but the first time i was aware of the outside world was in 1997 and it was because one of my really close friends went to canada and her family were being prepared to go to canada and that was for the first time i realized you know uh, you know in the in the in the norse songs and church songs for for that matters there's a song which is a scripture that talked about there is a world out there that is like milk and honey yeah. you know yeah, yeah, now yeah. i realize it was israel but <laughs> <laughs> at that time uh it seemed like it was america hmm. you know it was america we were all waiting for this world that has that is milk and honey you know, so in 1997, for the first time, my friend was going to Canada and all of a sudden we were all aware that we were one day we'll go to this place. Mm. Yeah. So that brought a lot of hope. Yeah, it kind of brings a lot of hope and also like a sense of something, things are going to improve. Yes. Um, and then if eventually you end up going to, to, to Canada, uh, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, how was that? Because I talked before we had the, this musician, um, um, uh, dynamic who's also like who, whose family uh, ended up uh, migrating from Kenya to the US and I was asking him what was your your biggest shock or your biggest uh, kind of culture shock or the experience that you you saw landing in the US <laughs> uh, yeah I, I actually have a whole chapter in my book yeah. called coming to America you know mm. so and it's a very funny um, funny chapter because people realize that it's worlds are not the same totally different world and i came from a place where there was no electricity so when they put us in this apartment we didn't even know how to turn the electricity on we didn't know what a fridge was even just baby diapers you know mm -hmm. we know nothing of that so it was a total culture shock the food were completely different we went hungry for a long time because we didn't like the food we didn't know what they were you know uh but i i describes i describe what it was like for me and my siblings especially my uh, outlook you know landing in new york city for the first time seeing all these lights um so it's it's different and it took time but i remember for the first year i had such a hard time adjusting to america i wanted to go back to dima refugees camp wow. I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i had missed all my friends the school how we play on the river um it was hard it took a it took a while to adjust to america so it wasn't easy yeah yeah i can imagine but, but, but then with time once it gets to to kind of like mingle and stuff like that so were you integrated into the school system also uh, so we arrive in the summer so we arrive in june and the, the school were out so our sponsor which we were sponsored through catholic mm. uh, catholic charities they they register us and put us in school during the summer which mm. was good because by the time we started school in the fall which in august we kind of already had a sense of what it's like to be around american kids you know um but my life took a a toll in such a short time we were in america for six months and i found myself in arranged marriage so i didn't have time to really focus on learning about my environment or making friends or you know just playing with the snow i i was i started struggling about my identity and my future right away so um there was a lot of things that i didn't get to experience or focus on or try to remember what it was like except that one thing about being in arranged marriage that i didn't want you know mm. so it's it was quite a shock too that, i mean that's probably like a biggest shock what i i mean I, i'm i'm definitely i'm a guy and i've never been in a arranged marriage totally I, I i'm coming from this from a a total yeah. pedestrian perspective but like what like in retrospect like what how was that experience like and what kind what what struggles does one go through as as you encounter such a such a such an ordeal you know um 
when I was in a refugee scam, I was already arranged for marriage at that time, twice before, mm. uh, before I was even 14. But at that point, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any of my own dreams about education or wanted to, to have my, my says, you know, uh, until I got to America. And when I got to America, I saw that my age group were, were in schools. They were going to school and they were, um, they were playing with their age mate. So I start seeing myself in a different sense, mm -hmm. you know, that I, oh, I could have an education. I could be, I could be a teacher. I could be a doctor, you know? Um, so the fight start right away. And that, that struggle was about my own independency. It was about, I wanted, I wanted to have a voice in my future and just seeing random guys coming to my house, talking about my future without me included kind of rubbed me in the wrong way to say the least. Mm. And I was, I was fighting for my voice. I mm. wasn't even fighting about the arranged marriage itself. I just wanted to be included, you know, mm. like if somebody had just come in and informed me and says, this is happening, you know, are you okay with that? I might've went with it. I'm not sure, but that was my struggle is that I'm right here. I know how to say yes or no. How come nobody's asking me, you know, this is mm. my life. So that was the struggle I was struggling with. I mean, isn't it kind of contradicting in a sense? You have some of things like of the U.S. the land of the free, <laughs> and and but also that this kind of uh, kind of secluded nuclear culture where like a lot of such practices thrive. Probably, I, I mean, at the custody of community or other people. How do you reconcile these two perspectives in a country where people thrive in individual liberty, the rights to all these things? One. One, one, one might think such a thing will never happen in the U.S. Yeah, you know, the laws are there. It is definitely against the law mm. of America to marry a, a girl or any child that is at a certain age, 18. Mm. Uh, in Nebraska, it's 16 mm. at the time when I was yeah. at that age, it's 16. So a parent can give or uh, can give their child a consent to get married in the state of Nebraska if they succeed and they totally, this kid just want to leave the house, there's issues and want to be independent, they can emancipate that child and be independent at the age of 16. So, and I knew the laws were there. And I knew I was, uh, uh, they were, my family were doing something against the law of the land. Mm -hmm. But our culture, it's so strong, so in dated in us that you don't want to do anything to go against it because you don't want the com community to think that you a disrespectful child. Mm. It's, certainly for me, that's what I was thinking at the time is that I don't want to embarrass my family. My dad was very well respected. My mom was well respected. And I didn't want the community to say that I'm a misbehavior kid, mm. you know, but I knew what was happening was against the law. Mm. And certainly I could have reported, but at the same time, I'm a South Sudanese girl yeah. who's not supposed to go against what's the I think the there parent. are bigger forces at work whenever it comes to this. Yeah. yeah. It's easier for someone to say, like, just go to the police. But yeah. if it's like, it's your not whole that world simple. is at, at risk, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not that simple. When you grow up in a culture that teaches you to be quiet, you know, or you go, you just agree to what the elder says. Yeah. When, when you, I mean, you're in South Sudan now, you've, you, you, you've come here, like, I think over the last one year or so, like, twice. So, um, you've been to Rumbek, you've been to so many places. When you see the struggle of the, of g the girls and women here, does that mirror some of your experiences or what do you see in terms of the, 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 the struggle, especially when it relates to this topic? Um, I mean, it doesn't, a week doesn't pass without us hearing about someone who wanted to marry their child off or a child who had to f face some kind of a thing. Like, what do you see and what, what kind of uh, experiences do you see here that might mirror your experience or might give you a sense of what is happening? You know, Nelson, I, I didn't have to be here. I, I wanted to be here. Mm. You know, my life in America, I have made it to where anybody that wants to be independent, want to be successful can be. Mm. I'm totally here because I'm being pushed by a, a, a force that's bigger than me, which is my purpose. And my purpose is to, is to help another child, another girl not go through the same pain I went through mm. when I was at that age. Um, 
I know there's a lot of girls every single day here being forced into marriages that they don't want to be in. And a lot of mothers are also struggling, trying to support their kids, their daughters, but yet they are being put in the same pool. Mm -hmm. So I'm here to show that I went through that. I empathize with them. I understand that it's a culture, but we need to look at another way. We need to see what a, a girl child can actually be if we listen to them, if we put their future first, if we allow them to have an education or at least have a say in how they want their future to be. You know, yeah. I fought so hard to have my education. Now my family see me as, you know, I help in the community. I help with my family, but that would have not been possible if I didn't fight so hard for my, for my independency and my future. But why, why should a young girl fight so hard? You know, is is like, I think probably, I think probably like almost all the girls will agree with you on this and that. Is that message getting through when you, you were in Rumbek, when you were like, we're meeting with this elderly man under a tree or having conversations with your uncles here or the brothers, are they listening? Is, 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 is that message getting through? Is, uh, is there anyone nodding into that message? So um, we've, been, we've been touring for the whole summer. We went to six different countries. And when we, when we decided to come on tour, I thought we were speaking for the women, for the young women of South Sudan. Mm. But I soon found out that we were also speaking for the young men of South Sudan. We are all going through the same struggles. A lot of young men, even in the upper Nile, where I'm from, are being forced into arranged marriages. It's not just girls. It's just that the majority of this is happening to girls. But the problem is also within men. They come to us, they talk to us about their struggle, forced marriages, the widow inheritance. These mm. men are being taken out from school in Nairobi, in Kampala, to go uh, take their their family, their dad or their brother uh, or wife in. So these issues are not just toward girls. Mm. So people are listening. We have a very vast audience, both male and female, that are supporting the campaign that we are doing right now to stop early child marriage, forced marriages, and to support education. So when we say girl child education, it's everybody, everybody yeah. education, young boys education is important. We can't we can just focus on one gender and isolate the others. It's happening to all of us. So in Rumbek, we met with the chiefs. They truly changing and, and our hosts uh, through the IRC, they, we, after we were done with the, with the chiefs, they came up, they were like, they totally different people. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they, they understand the importance of allowing their daughters to go to school. Mm. They, they have in, in uh, Lake State, they have 54 different chiefs that are fighting for this, uh, for this cause, mm. the gender-based violence, the girl-child education to make sure their arranged marriages and forced marriages decrease in this state of Rumbek. So the message is getting there, it's getting through. Yeah. So the message is getting there. Um, I mean, I want to go back or is it or forward to, to your life in the military mm. or your life starting in the military because you served in the US um, Army. Um, what made you, uh, during the army and and probably like what what are the experiences in that um yeah and some i know some people are like okay why didn't you go to south buy the book that's my message to you <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to go chronological i'll say like buy the book um uh, yeah maybe you can just take me into that into the experience of joining the military and the life there and you know we we brought few books so yeah. if anybody here want to buy the book uh, they can definitely do so. The book is $20 mm. and you can convert that to the current rate of the South Sudanese pound. Um, I, I joined the army. I decided to join the army in 07, mm. between 07 and 08. I was in my second year in university. And at that time, my brother Quith, who's my elder brother, had just came back from Iraq, who was also uh, a service member, his infantry. He had just came back from deployment, a very long deployment. And if you guys remember at that time, like 05, 06, the war in Iraq was very intense. Very intense. And yeah, the US uh, military in general lost a lot of people. 
my brother came back with mental wounds no physical wound but a lot of mental wounds and uh he ended up getting discharged out of the army due to instability but i found myself uh going through that process of healing him and finding recovery taking him to physical or uh, to uh counseling therapy uh medical doctors and i was at the same time in my nursing school so i really got interested in serving thinking that, okay, my brother came back very wounded. I want to give back to somebody else's brother and somebody else's son. And I told my brother that I was going to join the military. And he told me, no, told me don't join. So anyway, I ended up joining thinking that I was helping. I was serving other families hmm. through, because they helped serve my brother by bringing my brother home, not wounded. And if he had gotten wounded, they would have brought him back to us alive. So, and I knew I had the capability as a registered nurse to do that. So that was the reason I thought I joined. But the older I get, um, at that time I was about 20, 22 years old, still in university. But the older I got, the more I became uh, distant from the community, further from the community. And I realized I was actually running away from myself. I was running away from the Sudanese community. Yeah. Because I was so hurt by my family. I was so hurt by the community at such a young age that I didn't want anything to do with them. And joining military was my way to get away from the community. And I had actually told myself at the time that I'm never marrying a Sudanese community. I'm never going back to South Sudan. I don't want anything to do with them because they disrespect women. They treat women bad. They don't treat them like real people. And I just didn't want anything to do with them. But, you know, life happened. You grow up and you realize you can never run away from who you are. Mm -hmm. So here I am back in South Sudan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that is, I, I think probably like, that's a better, that, that's a better, uh, what do you call it? That's a, someone says, I think Boniface Mwangi, he was here and he's saying when you reach a certain age, you, he, he's, he's, he's running away. He was, he joined the church. Um, he said like you either you either get absorbed into a gang or you get absorbed into something else probably that's a better way of uh, of running away <laughs> uh, yeah like get, getting getting absorbed into something are there any values I think definitely there are what are the values from the military probably that kind of helped you in in your in your military life but also later on in life in doing the stuff that you're doing right now I think one of the things that the military taught me the most is um, speaking up, mm -hmm. speaking up. I joined, in, I joined the United States Army as an officer. And when you come in as an officer, officer, they automatically assume you as a leader, like in charge of people, mm -hmm. you're young or not, they put you in charge. Uh, so right away, I start, became a head nurse, you know, in charge of seven people which we call platoon or you know a unit in the hospital so being able to have these soft skills you know like listening skills you know understanding and 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 making sure that it's not this person is not just a nurse or a, a soldier is a holistic care um, or a whole human being uh, so the military taught me leadership taught me how to how to serve mm. you know um, so this is one of the big skills that I learned in my journey but there is so many things that they they taught me as a person yeah. you know so um, we will we'll be taking a few questions um, uh, shortly I wanted to know um, a little bit about the work like the, 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 the foundation and the work the organization that you're doing right now but prior to that I also wanted to know like how you ended up meeting Camila who's who's here in the in the in the audience um, uh, how do you <laughs> yeah because because she's uh, she's also like she's you, you you, you're working together. She's your partner in the organization. Yes. Camilla is a multi-purpose woman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I met Camille in 2016. Mm. I met her through a business. We are both business women. Mm. Yeah. So in 2016, we were introduced. Camille is, uh, is also a mom of two daughters, beautiful daughters. She's a retired Air Force of 25 years. Wow. She just got out a year ago. She's a businesswoman, as I said, a writer. She mm -hmm. has published several books, uh, editor. And, uh, and now, you know, she's here with me, a business partner in our nonprofit organization called 
I am Nyatong Yik, which is here in South Sudan and also in America. Mm. But I, I, I think we became very, very close kind of sisters in, 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 the, um, in the writing of this book. Mm. Yeah. So initially we just knew each other. We meet on conferences. We talk on, on the conference calls. But in 2000, 2020, in 2020, I call her up and I ask her if she would edit my book. Mm. Yeah, I was in the middle of uh, writing the book. Camille wrote books, but never been an editor, mm. but she prayed about it. She said, I can do it. She edited the book and it did a wonderful job. Mm. How many people read, I am my mother's wildest dream? How many people here? Yeah. One. Hello. Yes, how are you? <laughs> Luca. Oh. <laughs> Luca was our coordinator in Cairo during uh, our Cairo event. Yeah. It's good to see you. Um, I know several people here read I Am My Mother's Wallace Dream. It's flawless. There is, there is not, there is not an, not even one error that would, you would find in that book mm -hmm. that is grammatical error, typo, or anything like that, because that woman is very, very good at what she does. Um, if anybody disagree with the book, it's usually about like, you know, the stories in the book or nothing to do with grammatical error or English. So she did a very, very good job. We came on tour together. We went six different countries throughout East Africa. It was her first time in Africa. Uh, she's African American, never went outside of or never came to Africa. But uh, she just, she loves it here. I also think because of her military background, she's very easy to adapt to whatever so, environment yeah. that she's in. <laughs> yeah. And we went back in August, we went back to the U.S. and we were called back to come back by the UNFPA. And, uh, and here she is. So she's my partner in I Am Nyatong Yuk Foundation. We're doing these calls together. We just came back from Rebecca today. Mm. So she is totally a newer girl. <laughs> no, no, for sure. Um, uh, she's, I, I think that's, that's, this work needs really someone who to stand there with you because yeah. it, it's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, what plans do you have for the future? What other things, what, what do you, what should we expect in the pipeline? And then we'll yeah. take questions. Yeah. So, uh, so I am Nyatongi Foundation, like I said, is here in Juba and it's a multi purpose also foundation. When we came here during the, the summer, we saw that um, is is way more than a book. It's mm. a culture shift that is that this book has brought. For the first time, a woman experience in South Sudan is outside the house. Mm. It's in public arena. And uh, people are really interested to to know who is this girl that talks about things like sex or, mm. you know, had a boyfriend and went to another boyfriend and divorced, like things that <laughs> Sudanese women not supposed to yeah. say, right? <laughs> um, so we left Juba and we knew that there is a bigger purpose to this book than, than my story, that other people, story, other women need to share their stories as well. So we went and uh, founded I Am Nyatong Yuk Foundation. Right Right before we left Juba, we were giving a land by one of our leader mm. and the land, the purpose for the land is to build a library for our future, our future generations. Uh, education now, we understand here in South Sudan is the one way that we're going to liberate ourselves and we need to take it seriously. So this land is here in Juba. Uh, it has no building on it, of course. So one of our biggest project is to build that library. Um, the second thing that we're doing with I Am Nyatong, you guys, you guys know, is a campaign, campaign to end early child marriage, mm -hmm. to promote girl child education, to advocate to decrease the high dowry price because a lot of our audience are young men. And no, they... that is something that we can really rally behind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when the problem really <laughs> affected individual, they really <laughs> advocate, <laughs> advocate for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not selfish at all. So uh, this yeah, mm. this is a, a, a cause or a situation, a norm that's affected our young yeah. men. It just like the arranged marriage and forced marriage for the girls. It's mm. the same, you know. Uh, so that is definitely something we talked about every single day. And, and you guys know, I talked to our leader, Dr. Rick, um, yeah. our right president and his wife. We talked about that and we saw the, the results. Yeah, Hopefully yeah. it has yeah. something to do with it. Yeah. But even if it has something, it has nothing to do with our conversation. We know now it's a that, good signal. yeah, we, the community knows that 
as individuals, you know, it start at home yeah. and our leaders, if our leader can make these decisions and start by them with themselves, mm. then it's definitely. A lot of us go. were rushing to ask him if there is anyone else in the pipeline <laughs> 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 because it's a, it's a very good signal. Yeah, um, yeah. it's a great signal. So uh. the other one we are working on is the gender based violence. But all of these things, uh, we have principle or we have programs like we have a scholarship program that we're working, asking for donations to sponsor uh, our youth that are around East Africa here in Juba. So far, we had awarded 1600 since we started wow. this, uh, but we need help with that. We also have counselings. So far, we've been doing it through social media, mental health counselling. We're connecting, connecting individuals with resources in their communities. Uh, but the future plan is that we will have an office here in Juba where we provide counseling for both men and women, youth and, and, and elders. And in addition to that, we do networking. This is a great yeah, networking yeah. opportunity. Yeah, I, I definitely benefit from great network. Yeah. yeah, so networking is important. So we have a multi facet of things that we are working on with I am Nyatongi Foundation. And we're glad the UNFPA sponsor Camille and I to come back here and go to Rumbek and go to a wheel and go to wow to advocate for these costs. But it's just the beginning of it. It's, it's just the beginning. A beginning I think definitely of it. there is more to come. Yeah. So we have, um, I think this is the time that I'll kind of open it up for a few questions mm -hmm. from the audience. Um, um, I think we have a a lot of the, the thing with this event is that like a lot of people when someone uh when someone leaves their house spends their time take their own fuel or whatever to come here this is something that's this is really awesome this is not something that happens just by by accident <laughs> yeah. thank you for coming i don't yeah. believe in accident <laughs> i believe you are here because you're meant to be yeah. here so well um i think um uh, daniel we have a we have a third mic um, um uh, camille if you can test if that mic is working and then, like, um, Lulhok will pass it around. Testing. Testing. Yep, yes. I think it works. Yeah, good. <laughs> Super. So um, you can just, like, raise your hand, and then uh, they'll be able to pass the mic to you. Um, and then you can ask your question. Um, so we have a very young and vibrant uh, audience here. Well, the young are tired yeah. of the old practices. <laughs> okay, cool. Then um, any questions or comments uh, are welcome. Yeah, any question? Uh, regarding the book or regarding Yaton's life? You just say your name and then your question. Okay, do I have to stand up, yeah? yeah. Um, good evening. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bashir. I'm a filmmaker and a content creator, right? So I would like to know about, um, you mentioned something with the military. That's what got me and that's the reason why I'm here because I asked Nelson yesterday when we were talking mm -hmm. and he said, um, she has background in military. I was like, whoa, okay. And then I asked you, can you tell me more? He said, you need, you need to show up in order for you to come and hear more about that. So I think the, the most part I would like to know is like, what was it like the, your first day? Because I mean, military has so many different parts, right? I mean, the infantry and all that, right? So which one was like, did you go to the front line? That's what I would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> or were you there taking care of people that are wounded or, you know, or, you know, taking care of people that are, you know, going through mental, you know, you know, issues and all that sort of stuff. That's the part I would like to know more about. And maybe your first day when you, when you join. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So I also spoke extensively about my military service, especially my deployment to Afghanistan in the book. So yes, I was in front line, but let me start with my first day in the military. So as you can see, I am a very girly girl, right? <laughs> like girly girl. I never imagined that I would be wearing boots, carrying guns, going to the bathroom with another woman. Um, so my first day back up, when I was being recruited, I asked my recruiter, I said two things. I had two demands versus if I have to work out, do exercise, I don't want to join. That was my first thing. She said, well, you're going to be an officer, a nurse. You won't need to work out. No requirement for, uh, for physical activity. Second thing, I had a, a recommend, I had a requirement of where I want to go. So I told her the hospital I want to work at. First day, I reported on Friday night to Fort Sam Houston, which was 17 hour drive from where I live, Omaha, Nebraska, went to Texas. On Friday night, we reported. Monday morning, I was told by my commander, come at four o'clock in the morning and be in, in a, a physical activities gear. So I showed up and we ran four mile. I pass out. 
<laughs> I pass out, literally blocked out. At that point, I knew I made a mistake. The se- right, we were released by maybe eight o'clock. We went home. We were done with our acti- uh, physical activities. We went. We went shower. I came in my uniform, which nobody showed me how to wear this uniform. I put it on all by myself. I was wearing these hoops in my uniform. I had full makeup gear, okay, full makeup earrings. So I showed I was walking toward the building, which where all the cadets were. The, my leader, which was a platoon sergeant in E7, walked out, met me, and said, wait. She said, this is your first day? I said, yes. She said, remove your earrings. I took off my earring. She said, go wash your face. (laughs) So this was, it was a total culture shock for me. In military, we don't wear no earrings, not even in the army. We don't even wear those little tiny, uh, tiny uh, studs. We don't wear full makeup. Glasses all have to be black. None of these uh, red, um, red things. So it took me time. But, you know, easily I can adapt. I know I was already in. Can't say I, I want to go back. But that was my first day in the military. Your second question is, was I on the phone line? So I'm a support staff. A, mil- uh, a medical personnel is a support staff. It's like a lawyer, a doctor. Uh, we come to support the, 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 the cavalry. We support the infantry, the men that go in the front line. But when you deploy, which I had an opportunity to get deployed to Afghanistan, we all live together. Because if somebody get in, incoming comes, which we, I mean, like um, direct fire bombs come in, we're in the camps. I, I never get a chance to go outside the camps, but we get bombs inside the camps. And if something happens, we we uh, we uh, respond to it. Like one of the examples that happened, a plane crash in our camps, and we had to respond to those casualties. So yes, I was in. I was deployed, saw all of that, but I come in as a support, as a support staff. Um, I enjoyed it. Enjoy my whole experience in the military. I would. I don't know if I would do it again, but I had a great experience. <laughs> let's say that I had a great experience. Yeah, being support, it, it is, it is, it is no less, it is no less uh, difficult, uh, even being a support staff. No, it's it's not. I mean, everybody has to pass their physical activity or physical test every six months. We all get tested the same test. Uh, infantry, we run together. I mean, you have to do your two mile run in certain minutes. You have to do push up. All of that is all the same. We all go to the to the range and go shoot our guns every six months. We get qualified. All of that is all the same. Um, it just the missions sometimes are different missions, mm-hmm. and and everywhere they would go, there would have to be some medical personnel there with them um, to yeah. support. Cool. Um, we'll take any other question um, if we have. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we can give uh, Lulu the mic here. Hey. Uh, Tani, don't push it up. Um, I haven't read your book, but I'm sure I'm going to buy one mm-hmm. and read it. I've been interested in reading it, just didn't know how to access it. Um, I wanted to ask you on your, fa- your m- past marriage. Um, did you divorce the man? And if you divorced him, um, how did you deal with the community? Because, you know, divorce is a taboo in this community. Mm. And I'm also a divorcee. Mm. And I know it's something that lives with you. You're always known as this person, you know, who left the marriage or something like that. So how did you manage to deal with the community? Yeah. So I think the situations, my situation certainly is different when it comes to divorce than you. But the, the similarity is the mindset or how we respond to other people's expectations of what divorce look like in the community. Or are we gonna, are we gonna stay in that situation, that difficult situation because we're afraid of what the community will say, right? So I left that marriage when I was 19 years old. I just left. Uh, didn't ask permission from my parents that I was leave- <laughs> I was leaving, um, and I wrote about it too in the book of how it all happens. In fact, he left. He left me with our daughter, which is she was two and a half at the time. Now she's twenty, and I raised her all by myself. 
Um, but at that point, I was done trying to please anybody. I was done trying to get permission from anybody or I, d- I was just ready to make my own decisions. So I left. Divorce, they actually, my fa- our families never came together to undo the marriage, even today. They have never come together. And that may has a lot to do with the American culture. Uh, it's, you know, I, I'm pretty sure here in South Sudan, you couldn't leave without the two families coming together and discuss the dowries. Yeah, that would not happen here, but it didn't happen for us in, South, in, uh, in America. He left, he left me in the house with a kid. His family never came back to my family to get their dowries. My family never called them. We just moved on. Yeah, um, but you know, you at one point, at some point, you have to realize that your life is important, your life is worthy, and that uh, family expectations or community expectations um, need to take a second seat. Yeah, they need to take a second seat, and because I contemplated suicide, I was hospitalized for suicide ideation. Could have lost my life. You know, is it worth it? You know, so sometimes you you have to you have to think about that because all those people I'm telling you, a lot of Sudanese women, if they have a choice, they would divorce. Yeah, they would divorce. So, what? What? One. What? Is, why is it that like, from when a couple divorces? It seems like it's a bigger, it's viewed as a bigger failure or a bigger scar or a tattoo on the woman than the man. The, 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 the impact is, is disproportionately different. A lot of things are disproportionately different in our culture. Everything is blame on the wife. You know, your husband cheat on you. Oh, what did you do? Mm. You know, are you not cooking home? Are you mean to him? Do you quarrel all the time? You're not, a, you're not a good wife. It's always reflecting back to the wife. It's a shift that we have to do. We have to, we have to change that because everybody has a role to, do, to play in the marriage. Mm-hmm. Can't always be. But our culture was designed to benefit the men from the beginning. You know, everything was designed by the men for the men in South Sudan culture. Mm-hmm. But we have now in this century, in this 21st century where now everybody has the rights, but not just the rights, but we can all benefit from each other ideas. We can all benefit from each other input in the family uh, decisions, in, in education, we can all benefit. So I, I really just believe the culture was designed to benefit the men and never for the women. And I think that's why we're here. That's the other discussions is yeah. will help us undoing it. I think. Um, yes, there is there is a hand there, right? Yeah. Yes, hello. I can imagine the headline tomorrow. Nelson encourages women to divorce. <laughs> 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 okay, let me let's uh, yes. get a question there. Hello, um, my name is Abul. So um, I wanted to know more about um, your relationship with your family after all this had happened did you ever have um a moment where you sat down and you talked about the issue of them forced merging you because um you know they have they should have kind of protected you kind of because most of the time it's uncles that usually do it you know yeah so did you sit down and talk about it or you just swept it under the rug and they yeah, moved on how was it how's your relationship right now yeah, and has also their mentality changed on it? Like, are they advocates now of, um, of this? You know, that's just a very good question. So I have two younger sisters. I'm the oldest sister, I'm older girl. I'm the second oldest child. So my older brother and I have like four or five years differences in our age. So when all of that were happening, it was, it was my, my family, especially my dad, kind of pinned me against my brother. So it was always me and my brother fighting, me and my uncles, which I have such a strong feeling toward uncles. I think they are the fire under all of these girls being forced into. Yeah, it's it's the uncles. I always say uncles are like, you know, um, 
and they need to chill. They need to go get their own cows, you know, go get their own cow for marriages. Uh, but I actually do have one uncle that I don't speak with even now. I don't speak to him because of what he did during that time. But my brother are very close friends now. He's my best friend, my older brother. And it took another uncle of mine from a different state, call us, put us on the phone and says, you guys need to fix them, this. You fix this quarrel that's happening between you. I keep hearing this, you and I, you keep fighting all the time, this and this, y'all need to fix it. So, and that was uh, probably 03. And so this marriage, arranged marriage happened in 2000. So by 03, my brother and I start fixing our relationship. So it got better and we were, great right now he might be watching this he's one of my big supporter my dad and i though my dad him and i took a very long time it took us maybe even three times we had talk and forgive each other because every five year or six year i seem to get angry again you know i would get angry toward him i would have to call him talked about these issues let him know how i feel and we would forgive each other and you know live life and then again something small trigger me and I get angry all over again. So forgiveness, I learned that forgiveness is an ongoing thing that I have to do every now and then. It's not a one-time thing. Uh, my dad has not forced any of my sisters into marriage after me. And he specifically told me that I learned my lesson and I, I will not do it again. And I, you know, none of your sister was ever forced. And it was because of the experience he went through with me. And um, so that ended with me. The forced marriage just ended with me. Now, when I wrote my book, I called him and I said, I'm writing a book. He, he tried to discourage. Um, he tried to tell me that I need to forgive it and let it go. That is such a long time ago and I shouldn't be talking about it anymore. But he later on became one of my big supporter. So he knows everything that I talked about now. He support me. He actually had people here call him from Juba and says, do you know what Nyajo wrote on this book? And are you supporting her? Um, and he said, yes, I support her. And I'm aware of the things that she wrote in the book. My mom, uh, you know, mothers, you know, they are always there for us. My mom, from the time I had my child at 17 year old, moved in with me to help me take care of my kid. So there was nothing that I ever need to, to forgive with her. We were always good. Even when I decided to leave the marriage, she, she, she was just there, she was supporting me. And uh, with the book, she was very supportive. Now she's very supportive. She tracks everywhere I go. She was just really concerned about what am I saying in the book about my father? You know, Sudanese mothers, they always concern about what are you going to say about your father? You know, they're very protective of their marriages and their homes and their husbands, regardless of what the relationship is like. So that was what my mom was very concerned about, you know. But now my whole family read the book, um, except my dad, the beginning. But before it was published, all my siblings read, read the book. They told my mom because she couldn't read English. They told her what I wrote in the book and they give me permission to publish it. They allow me to go and talk in public about it. So we are good. We are good. This is something that I have processed with my family. I let it go. So I'm here from a healing perspective. I have healed from all my trauma. I have let it all go, but it's something that I don't want other people to experience. And that's why I speak about it. Yeah. Is, there, is there any, any part of the book that made your mom say like, eh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what is the, what is the new exclamation on your face. <laughs> is there when if I were they told her in the translated dish was like <laughs> yes 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 and I'll tell you guys <laughs> so I was telling my mom some of the stories I wrote about in the book so I was telling her I wrote about this person I wrote about this person these are people I dated right yeah I wrote about this person this person she's like you gonna talk about all those men in the book? <laughs> <laughs> so she was really embarrassed that her daughter went through all these relationships. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it almost feels scandalous. Yes, she's like, no woman talks about those. So I think for her, that is the most like, oh, you know? <laughs> I think, I think for sure um, uh, all parents will have some kind of a way because because I think and I also see this also with my family it's like 
when my dad tells my story, it's almost like a choreographed dance of his good parenthood. <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, it, 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 it's, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I had incidents where my my mom would reduce an age of one of our one of my siblings, or would paint someone as a sudden genius in whatever <laughs> things. I, I, I think our parents just have their way of writing our stories, and it, I think probably when we write it in a way, it seems. Uh, <laughs> a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's t- let's let's take a question from the gentleman in the corner. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Luca Jal. I was a coordinator for Youth Africa Book Tour in uh, Cairo. Uh, but last time I did not find time to speak because I was the host. Uh, it's great to see you today. It's good to see you uh, too, Luca. <laughs> there's something you are talking about because I was not there when you start the program. You talk about gender-based violence, which is a one-off topic I'd like to ask you about it uh, here in the country you know like the gender based gender based violence always only teach the girl about the right and forget to enlighten the men who are the cause of gender based violence so now it bring a, a great matter that ladies are fit against men which we fear uh, will your campaign continue teaching only girl about the rights without talking to men? Mm. That's a question. Uh. That is a very good question. And to clarify, my campaign was never really just to teach the girls. Okay? Because I totally understand that violence is, it doesn't recognize gender. It happens to boys just as much as it happens to the girls as well. Now, the campaign really focused, not just my campaign, but to end for Genovese or to end the Genovese violence has truly been men being the perpetrator and the girls, women being the victim. Um, We do know for sure here in South Sudan, women are the victim of the gender-based violence, right? We can't deny that. But it doesn't take the, the fact that men also suffer from uh, violence. I think just one example that this high dowry price is a gender-based violence toward our young men. I believe that, you know, let alone the, the, the abuse of physical or mental or, you know, financial sexual abuse that all happens in families or relationship. But just this one example is a gender-based violence. So we are advocating for our young men or any family that is experienced that. We, Camille and I had sit with many people. We sat with a guy today at the airport, you know, to talk about that, about him and his wife, you know, about how they could live in a harmonious home without having to go through that. Violence, I think one thing that we have to understand about violence is that it also has different, it manifests in different ways whether it's through finances, a husband or a wife restricting, you're giving you a budget or restricting you from money or denying you money, that's violence. Uh, whether it's mental, like isolation or, or neglect, you know, those are all violence. And chapter six in my book, you guys know, my, my ex-husband was not physical with me, but the violence that he inflicted in me was terrible that I almost wanted to kill myself, you know? Um, And it happens, it happens to boys. So yes, Camille and I are out there advocating for our young boys as well, um, for, for our men. In fact, we will incorporate some classes that are might be just men. You know, we don't know how we're going to do it yet, but it might be just men-based classes about how uh, they can also uh, help themselves, not just the violence and the violence, but also how uh, sh- the mindset, you know, how they could be supporter of this whole campaign to, r- to help South Sudan in general. So definitely it's something that is in our agenda. Um, let's uh, take a question here. From yeah. the gentleman in yellow. Thank you very much. My name is Matias Samuel Timatio. I'm a South Sudanese. Uh, it's nice meeting you. Though I've not read the book, I will try my best and find one. My it question. Is here. You don't have to try. You will buy after this. <laughs> you don't try. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My question is uh, 
you have talked about uh, this campaign of uh, gender-based violence and then uh, forced marriage and uh, early ma uh, marriage in South Sudan. We have been uh, having so many organizations around uh, campaigning the same uh, campaign. What will be the difference around? Because we seems not to be the if uh, we are not seeing the effect on ground. What will it be? How will it be different from others? Thank you. That is very interesting because we just had that conversation today with the country director for the UNFPA. <laughs> yeah, we just had that conversation how to approach things differently. Um, you know, I, I knew that there's a lot of international organization, a lot of NGOs here in Juba, a lot of local uh, groups has been fighting this. And the more I speak to people, the more I realize that this has been spoken and fought against for years you know we met with uh with dr pauline if you guys know dr pauline Riak. we met with her in rumbeck yesterday at the university of rumbeck and she explained to us how they've been doing this 30 years ago you know um and it's still happening one i want to tell you that it is showing change is happening you know, as I go around, I realize there's men wearing the t-shirts, there's men advocating, going with us, supporting us. They tell us they don't beat their wives because they know it's wrong. So even though you don't see it out there on the streets of Juba, it's happening. People are listening and people want different. People want to cohab cohabitate in a harmonious environment in their homes and, and raise kids that are not traumatized by violence like most of us are. Um, but for me, I came out to share my story. I didn't initially intend it to come and fight gender-based violence or advocate for early child marriage or to promote girl child education. This came out all out of blue for me. I simply just wanted to share my story. Yeah. I want to share my story to show that, you know, I went through this early child marriage. I fought for my rights. I got an education. Now I can go anywhere in the world. I can be here in South Sudan and have, I haven't worked since May and I'm fine. I'm a single woman. I'm a mother. That girls can be independent and can, does not have to depend on the guys. So that's why I share my, my story. I share my story to inspire, to impact people. I didn't know it would turn into a campaign, although I'm so excited because this is something I'm passionate about. The one thing that I know is different from how it's all been, is the fact that I'm a Sudanese woman who have experienced the gender-based violence, who has experienced the forced marriage. And me coming out and sharing my story with either survivors or parents that are contemplate to do that to their daughters, I'm hoping and praying that I can appeal to their emotions, whatever that is, so that they can choose otherwise, whether they choose to send their daughters to the school or choose to uh, stop their arranged marriage, just by simply seeing me and seeing how my life is now. So I, I don't have all these fancy ways to say that I'm the one that's going to come and rescue, but I know this is a fight that we all need to fight together. This is a collective effort and with time change will come um thank you for being with us uh, on an evening with and i also really want to thank our uh, our awesome audience for their commitment and time <laughs> um yeah this couldn't have ended on a higher note than this um and i I think I genuinely, most of the times we have these conversations here and, and, and I mean, we do projects in this place funded by people and what, and you do M&E and stuff like that. But the, the thing about conversations and having this and this idea of moments and spaces, because you have, if you grow up in the village, you have like people sit around fire, that's a space. And then they discuss that's great moments. So for us, we usually like focus on, okay, this is a space we want to create moments. Um, some of the stuff that we discuss here, probably someone will be, get inspired to write a book <laughs> or to, um, or to do mirroring reflection, like what she was asking, like how I went through this, you went through this, how do you see it? 
So, so, um, so as much as this is like a, a group of 20 people or like 25 or what, some of the, the sparks that comes from this place, we, we never know where, where it will, uh, where it will take you next. Mm -hmm. So, so it's definitely, um, worth all the, all the resources. It's worth all the time worth all the flying, <laughs> the jet lag and all the way from Rumbek to here. Um, and also like it's worth like all the people who dedicated their time um, and, and like the, the level of excellence that is being exhibited by our sound people and the, um, and the people who, who are engineering this. And even the, the audience here who like passionately resisted the action movie that is going there <laughs> and opted to follow us. So <laughs> we don't take it for granted. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I wouldn't want to end this without allowing Camila to say a word or so. Probably you can come to the stage um, so that our cameras can see you. Um, um, just you can just like um, just say a thing uh, to our audience here and tell us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, from <laughs> to her. Um, uh, you can just tell us uh, a bit about your work and, and also the connection between you and also to South Sudan. Well, I want to thank you for giving me this space and <laughs> yeah. opportunity to sit with you guys around this campfire or the fire yep, as yep. you called it. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure to come here to South Sudan. Um, I always say I feel like I was called over 20 years ago um, when I read a book called What's the What? if you guys have heard that, by Dave Eggers. And that was my first um, indoctrination to the South, or not, it wasn't South Sudan, Sudan then, it was Sudan, um, but the culture. And that book gripped my heart in a way that a lot of books haven't. And I would always, people would ask me, you know, why is that your favorite book? And I couldn't quite explain it. You know, it was just something that, like I said, it literally gripped my heart and I read it several times and I always refer back to a lot of the things that happened there. And then 20 years later, you know, Nijok and I became business partners and friends. And then 22 years later, here we are writing this book together. And then 24 years later, um, I'm sitting in South Sudan. And um, so what I wanna say to a lot of people, um, a lot of people, when I come here and, and I speak, you know, um, I am an American, an African-American. Um, and so they believe that I don't understand the struggle. They believe that I don't understand the culture. Um, I had a lot of years and someone who's, you know, from here to help me learn about it. But what I realized is that um, culture is culture everywhere. Um, but human emotion is the same. We are all gifted with the same emotions. I know what fear is like. I know what violence is like. I know what it's like to be abused. I know what it's like to be um, forced into things that you don't want to, to participate in. Um, I know what it's like to have a child young. I know what it's like to be married young and that marriage not be so good, you know? Um, so I have a lot of personal experience with some of the things, but just in a different way. Um, but with that being said, and I liked his question about that, you know, what makes this different? Um, I don't know if it's the what makes it different. Sometimes I believe it's the who that makes it different. And I believe that um, Nijok has a very specific skill set. Uh, both of us are very much into mindset. And we understand that change requires an awareness first. And there's a process and change takes time and it takes persistence and it takes perseverance and it takes uh, consistency, diligence, all of those things. And when you can speak to that in a way that people don't know, you know, beating over the head, but you know how to create the awareness, you know how to um, continually show them how it benefits or how it detracts from what their, their goals are, you know, how um, it affects the entire culture, how it will affect your, your child or the land or whatever. Uh, when you are able to articulate that and people can see themselves in that situation, people can imagine a future that's different and better for them, uh, you get a lot of buy-in. And so we're hoping that with all of this, 
um, sharing her story. Um, I have, like I said, a, a few different skill sets, but uh, by just supporting her and, and back in the message, you know, South Sudan is not my home, but I feel very much at home here. And I feel very passionate about the causes and the gender-based violence and elimination of the early child marriage and, and uh, forced marriages and girl child education and all those things. Uh, my heart is really here. I didn't have to come here. I came here as a volunteer as well. And God willing, I will be back and I will continue to help in every way possible, so. Thank you so much, Camille, for, for this, yeah. There's a place called Yambio. Yambio. Yeah, I know you'll be to these places, these people are intimidating you with their height and what. <laughs> Go to Yambio, you'll fit right in, they give you a name, <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't feel any different. Uh, I know like some of these are places here, people are like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know people are saying, oh, our dark and shiny skin, our height. Go to Yambio, you fit right in, they give you a name. And we, <laughs> and they're very nice fruits. I love the tall, dark, shiny skin. I love it. <laughs> I think it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. So. Yeah. So um, South Sudan is very diverse, by the way. It's it's also like one of those like very diverse places in terms of linguistics, in terms of uh, the cultures. Um, you go to places where you find people they have a fish my height. And you go to other places where people have never seen a fish their whole life. <laughs> so it's a very diverse country. And I think your presence here also um, really echoes the support. And for us also, like uh, for South Sudanese, when you see someone, <laughs> is that the only time people take, you know, like for you to come from the US, you probably, you're in a metal box for like over 10 hours to like thousands of, of feet just to come to this place. You could have landed anywhere else. <laughs> There's so many other places with so much. Ghana is inviting people. <laughs> Ghana is trying to snatch people to come there, but you decided to come to this place. Uh, we don't take this for granted, and I think for us as South Sudanese, we see this. We're like that. That's um, that's a lot of effort, and I think also as South Sudanese, we want to put our our weight behind her and behind the work that you guys are doing. So thank you so much for your presence here. I know there are people who are longing to take pictures and want to go and post and say they were here. <laughs> I don't want to deprive them from that opportunity. Uh, let's call this uh, uh, a very good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>